One. You'll hear a guide talking to visitors about a tourist attraction. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Roman Baths. My name's Amanda, and I'm your guide for today. Before we begin the tour, I'd like to point out that we have child carriers, free of charge, of course, for those of you with young children. And I can see that there are one or two of you here this morning. It might make things a bit easier for you than using a pushchair. If you don't want to carry your coats and bags around with you, there is a cloakroom behind reception where they'll be quite safe. Also, should anyone want to use the bathroom, there's one here in the reception hall opposite the ticket office, and another one by the shop where we end our tour, right by the exit. Having mentioned the shop, I should tell you that it's full of interesting things for you to remember your visit by. Posters, postcards, replicas of the Gorgon's head, the Haruspex stone, and the statues that you'll be seeing on your tour. There are also games, books, and videos for children, and other souvenirs. Our first stop will be the terrace, where you will get your first view of the baths. Now, the statues that line the terrace here are of Roman emperors, governors of Britain, and various military leaders. These aren't from Roman times either. In fact, they were sculpted in 1894, especially for the grand opening of the baths in 1897. But what you can see from here is only a fraction of the whole Roman bath site, which stretches below ground level under the surrounding streets and squares of the town. While we're here on the terrace, getting our first look at the baths, let me fill you in on a bit of the history. This site, with its hot springs, has long been seen as a sacred place, and the first people to build here were the Celts, and the shrine they built was dedicated to the goddess Sulis. Of course, back in those days, they had no way of explaining how hot water came to be bubbling out of the ground, so they believed it to be the work of the gods. When the Romans came, they too built a temple here and dedicated it to their goddess Minerva. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. The bath you can see from here is called the Great Bath. Not very imaginative, I know, but it is the biggest. Impressive, isn't it? At one time, it was housed in a huge vaulted hall, forty meters high, which, for many people of the period, must have been the largest building they'd ever seen in their lives. The bath itself is one point six meters deep, ideal for bathing, and has steps leading down to the water on all sides. The niches or alcoves you can see all around the bath would have had benches. And possibly small tables for drinks and snacks, not a bad way to spend your free time, relax, and tell yourself it's all good for your health. Let's move on to our next stop, the Sacred Spring. This is the heart of the site, where the hot water bubbles up from the ground at a temperature of forty-six degrees centigrade. The water comes up from a depth of between roughly two and a half thousand and four and a half thousand meters, where geothermal energy raises the water temperature to between sixty-four degrees and ninety-six degrees. Over a million liters of this hot water rise up here every day, and as well as being hot, the water is rich in minerals, and it was thought it would cure various ailments and illnesses. 
In fact, people came here from all over the Roman Empire to try out its healing powers. Before we take a look at the changing rooms and saunas, which are known as the East Baths, and the plunge pools and heated rooms of the west part of the bathhouse, we'll pass through the site of the temple and the temple courtyard. Here we are. This temple is one of only two known classical Roman temples in Britain. The other is the Temple of Claudius at Colchester. This temple is said to date from the late 1st century AD, being built between 60 and 70 AD. But the original temple has been knocked about and added to over the centuries, and what you can see here are just bits of the original temple. OK, shall we move on? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a radio interview about giving up smoking. First, look at questions 11 to 13. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 13. For these questions, there are four alternatives. A, B, C and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. And now, let's hear what Mr Gold has to say about kicking the habit of smoking. It was connected with wanting to change your life and your desire to become an actor. Is that right, Mr Gold? Um, yes. So, can you tell our listeners a bit more about how you managed to give up? Um, well, I, I enrolled on a variety of evening courses where I found I wasn't able to do the warm-up sessions. Bending down to touch my toes made me breathless. Even though I hated to admit it, the problem wasn't so much my sitting around all the time, but my 15 to 20 a day smoking habit. If I'd been able to limit myself to three or four cigarettes a day, there'd have been no problem, but I was seriously addicted. And I'm talking about waking up at 3am dying for a cigarette, or, in the days before 24-hour shopping, driving across London at night to buy a packet of cigarettes when I ran out. <laughs> But above all, my addiction meant making sure I never ran out, at the expense of everything else, including necessities. So what did you do? The thought of all my past attempts to give up just wouldn't go away. This was something that had constantly been on my mind, especially first thing in the morning with the chest pains, coughing fits and headaches, not to mention the frequent colds and throat infections. But I couldn't imagine life without smoking. I also enjoyed my life... But the thing I longed for most was to escape the trap of a job I was bored with. I knew what I wanted, and I understood something else, too. This time, I was going to keep my little plan a secret. Now look at questions 14 to 20. As the interview continues, complete the sentences. Write no more than three words for each answer. On the 1st of July, I managed to get through 24 hours without a single cigarette. The next day, I got to 48 hours. Then I aimed for 100, 500, 1,000. Easy. It was my own little private game, and I was winning it. If anyone mentioned they hadn't seen me smoking, I simply said I was cutting down. I had to be sure of success. Eventually, a month passed, and I felt safe enough to come out. <laughs> I'd lost count of the number of hours I'd gone without a cigarette. All I suffered was a couple of bad headaches, and then I was set for my most healthy year ever. Not one single cold for over 12 months. I now realise that the secret of my success was to look upon this as an exciting adventure, a way of helping me to become an actor. And because nobody knew what I was up to, I never once feared the accusation of having no willpower if I failed. With the right attitude, the whole thing turned out to be a lot easier than expected. 
I finally did get into much better physical shape, go to drama school and become a professional actor. Very interesting indeed. <laughs> I'm sure we all wish we had Mr Gold's determination. Well, thank you very much, Mr Gold. And I hope our listeners will learn from the experience you and our other guests have talked to us about today and perhaps find their own road to success. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on rivers. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Please tell me about the current state of the Amazon. We have increased deforestation, increased human population relating to deforestation, and a role of fire in the Amazon on a scale that's never been seen in history. At the same time, you can see progress in trying to counter that negative trend. How do you see this? We see this in the creation of national parks and indigenous areas, and efforts to fund sustainable development activities for locals. We see both good and the bad, and it's going to be a race to finish. I understand that you started the Minimum Critical Size of Ecosystems project. Could you tell me about it? A number of years ago, it became apparent that those practicing conservationists didn't have the scientific information available to properly design a conservation area. They didn't know how big it had to be, right? People were learning that as forests fragment, the fragments begin to shed species after they become isolated, so they end up becoming poor examples of what they had been. This relates to the size of the fragment. Do people still study this? Yes, there is a rich subfield of conservation biology that looks at the efforts of fragmentation. One of the consequences is a general policy response to set up protected areas that are fairly large, something on the order of 1,000 square kilometres. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. Can you talk a little bit more about the forest fragmentation? As habitats are destroyed, they are accompanied by habitat fragmentation. So when 50% of a forest is lost, the remaining 50% being is not one large block, but smaller pieces, which makes the conservation problem even worse than saying that 50% has been lost. And this affects not just forest, but species diversity, correct? In terms of species loss, we can't give you precise numbers about how many species are lost because of these fragmented landscapes, but we're beginning to get close to where we can make that estimation. And so one of the policy responses to all of this, beyond just trying to create large protected areas, is to try and reconnect the fragments. You've been active in many projects studying the Amazon region over the years. Can you tell us about that process of understanding the Amazon? When people first started looking at conservation priorities, there was not much information about the geography of plant and animal species. One of the first clues was an analysis done in 1969. This looked at bird species and found geographic clusters of species which occurred nowhere else. And those are priority areas for conservation. Was this when people began prioritising refuges? Yes, it was the first time that someone looked basin-wide at priorities, giving priority to so-called refugian areas. Was this when the new trend to use geographic information systems, or a GIS, started? That was in 1990 after we worked out a whole set of biological and conservational priorities and produced a big map using GIS. What are some of the things that GIS does? Well, there are several advantages of using a geographic information system. 
First, you can continually update the system so that it's now a constantly changing picture. You can actually watch changes. Then you can include large amounts of data, including information about the vectors of development. Roads, railroads, pipelines, hydroelectric projects, etc. And finally, because it is accessible on the internet, it makes this information available to anyone who's interested. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about sports. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Not all people like to work, but everyone likes to play. As sports help people live happily, they help to keep people healthy and feeling good. When people are playing games, they move a lot. This is good for their health. Having fun with their friends makes them happy. So all over the world, men and women, boys and girls, enjoy sports. Since long ago, adults and children have called their friends together to spend hours, even days, playing games. Sports usually take a variety of forms. Organised competitions, which draw huge crowds to cheer their favourite team to victory. Athletic games, played for recreation anywhere sufficient space is found. And hunting and fishing. Most sports are seasonal, so that what is happening in sports depends on the time of the year. As sports change with the season, People often do not play the same games in winter as in summer. If you want to know what others' favourite sports are, first of all, you should find where they live. Generally speaking, people in hot areas are fond of swimming, while people in cold places love skiing or skating. In this case, surfing is believed to be an important sport in Hawaii. The Pacific Ocean sends huge waves up on the beaches, Waves that are just right for surfing. Some sports, including wrestling, boxing, horse racing, etc., are called spectator sports, as the number of spectators greatly exceeds the number of players in the game. Other sports are called participant sports, drawing a crowd of onlookers only on special occasions, such as tournaments. Some sports are commercial and professional, with players who are paid for their participation and with audiences who pay admission to watch. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.